This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Okay. Well, you know, I, uh, I thought uh, I was going to have a little longer than I am today, so I'm really going to go fast. And uh, if you like, um, you know, high throughput, it'll work real good for you. If not, uh, I'll have questions and answers after the rest of you have to take off. Yeah, I had these pictures here I found from your website I thought were quite good. I really appreciated this because I'm into my medical practice involves lifestyle change so I really like change and there's a beautiful picture look at you can see so much difference that you've made here in uh, I guess that's from 1970 till uh, 2000 and something I think the, the website said so that's quite a um, quite a change you've made my topic is lifestyle medicine in the Marshalls we're really looking at the diabetes and wellness outcomes research for the Republic of the Marshall Islands. This is a multi-million dollar congressionally funded study using lifestyle to treat and prevent diabetes in the Marshall Islands. I have the privilege of serving as co-PI. The presentation today I want to do is just talk to you a little about the epidemic of type 2 diabetes in the Marshall Islands. Then I want to show you the rationale for why we're using type uh, lifestyle interventions to treat type 2 diabetes, a little of the program description, what we're doing, and program outcomes. These are preliminary results. We're, we're still in our, we're halfway through at this point. And then some conclusions and questions and answer. You know, the CDC reports that one in three children born in the year 2000 will die with type 2 diabetes. This is the adult ons onset type. And that grows to one out of two black and Hispanic children, and it's higher still in Micronesia. And as you know, the, most, the biggest killer of folks with type 2 diabetes is not end-stage renal disease, it's heart, heart disease. Over 65% die with heart attack and stroke. Type 2 diabetes in the Marshall Islands. In the 1950s, there were three persons in all of the Marshall Islands with type 2 diabetes. These were three elderly, fairly well-to-do old men. However, a large survey done in the year 2002 reported recently about 3,000 folks. They found that the average fasting blood sugar average is 110. There was a significant portion of, juvenile, of the juvenile population had a fasting blood sugar of over 126. So it's the number one health concern in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The prevalence is over 30%. We don't know exactly the numbers, but the uh, best numbers we have is somewhere between 28 and, and 40 percent. And it's rising, that we do know. And the age at onset is dropping, and new cases being diagnosed in their teens. And from what uh, you, may, you may be aware, some of you being here in the Pacific, more even than I from the mainland, it's my understanding that this problem is not only in the Marshall Islands, unfortunately. This is all of Micronesia and federated states of Micronesia, et cetera. So treating the complications of diabetes is consuming the resources of the Ministry of Health and it's really undermining their ability to provide adequate medical services. It's taking their eye off the ball, if you will, taking the focus off of prevention because this is really what we have to do more to fight type 2 diabetes. Let me just show this chart here, looking at the effects of type 2 diabetes. And here we're going to be comparing on the left non-diabetic. So this will be our controls. And then the middle column is going to be if the diabetes began over 45 years of age. That's the way we used to see it all the time. And now then we have a third column, and that's on the far right. And that's going to be for those individuals for whom the onset of type 2 diabetes was diagnosed before the age of 45. And this is a serious, serious problem we see f coming our way. Notice the non-diabetic, this is a relative risk of, of MI, myocardial infarction. We consider that a 1 as our base here. Then onset 
over 45, it was about not quite three, uh, three and a half, four times the, the risk, okay? But if the onset is under 45, notice this, it's 14 times the risk of heart attack. And for stroke, the numbers look even worse in some ways. This is about the same, perhaps 3.137, but the risk of stroke for onset under 45 years of age goes to 30. The CDC reports that the majority of folks with type 2 diabetes are overweight. This seems to be connected. We're not sure which is the chicken or the egg. Is it the overweight or is it the insulin resistance? And perhaps there's some interaction there. Two of three Mer Americans are overweight or obese. The, this is from the CDC numbers. Over 67% have a BMI greater than or equal to 25. And in the reality, probably 85% of us, and I would be in that group, would actually benefit, our health would be more ideal if I lost a few pounds. Our girth rate is accelerating. Let me show you a picture to illustrate that. Here's the 1991 U.S. obesity rate state by state comparison. And notice the change from 91 to 2001. 91 to 2001. Had to add, we had to add new colors to the chart, literally. There's a recent article, uh, the July 26th issue of New England Journal of Medicine. You may have seen this. This is, I will tell you, this is going to be a watershed article, I guarantee you, in the field that it's in. This is uh, by Christakis and Fowler looking at the spread of obesity in a large social network over 32 years. They're looking at the Framingham data in a very interesting way. And I don't have time. We can have a whole talk about this. But I wanted to show you, illustrate for you, here's the social network in 1975. Each circle represents an individual and the size of the circle represents their BMI. Okay? And when they reach a certain level, above 25, the circle becomes yellow. And so what we're going to see here is starting in 75, we see these individuals in this network. And notice what happens over time as we go to 1980, 1985, 1990, 1995, 2000. This is a very interesting article. If you have a friend and that person lists you as one of their best friends and you list them as one of your best friends, if that person becomes obese, your risk of becoming obese is four to ten times what it would be. It's, there's a very, it turns out that, that obesity and other chronic diseases exhibit some very interesting properties that are characteristic of, con of being contagious. It's like there's a contagious aspect to chronic disease that is just now starting to be explored, and that's these, these gentlemen are leading, uh, some of the leading researchers in that. In the New England Journal, Dr. Ledwick, David Ludwig reports, the average American has a life expectancy of 77.6 years. After almost 200 years of continuous increase, that could be about to change. If the trends continue, the present generation could be the first to die younger than their parents. Here, let's take a look at causes of death in the U.S. This is from the CDC Burden of Disease Report, year 2000. You'll notice on the left-hand side listed are the proximal causes of death, heart disease, cancer, stroke, so forth. This is what we call proximal. This is what the person died of on the death certificate. But let's look at what the ultimate cause of death was. What, what caused this heart disease? What caused this cancer? Okay, and there's been a lot of research done on this. So we find tobacco cartoon we call it. This is not a quantitative number. These, these graphs, I'll, I'll point that out clearly. This is, we do not have quantitative data that tells us exactly what the proportion is. This is based on a number of studies of this. Notice the next one. Poor diet and inactivity and alcohol, excessive drinking of alcohol. The top 10 medications in sales just confirms that. I mean, you look at the top 10 sales, I believe this data is from the year 2001, but I'm not certain about the year of it. But point is here, illustrates, yes, this is true, lifestyle diseases. Looking now specifically at type 2 diabetes and lifestyle, the Nurses Health Study is 85,000 nurses. They found 3.4 percent were in a group with low risk for type 2 diabetes. And here are the attributes that they found. The BMI of less than 25, high cereal, cereal fiber diet that was high in unsaturated fats, low trans fat, low glycemic load, moderate to vigorous physical activity, at least 30 minutes a day, and they were non-smokers. Their risk, they were at low risk. In fact, they were 
at tremendously low risk. They had a relative risk of 0.09, which means that 91% of type 2 diabetes in this cohort, this group, could be attributed to habits and behavior that were not in the pattern that we just described. The Finnish diabetes type 2 uh, diabetes study was 522 middle-aged overweight subjects. They were random. This was a randomized study. They were randomized for uh, 3.2 years. One group was individualized counseling. You can see there what the, was talked, what they, what the counseling was about, involving reducing weight, intake of fat, and so forth, versus control, which was a standard care. The changes reduced the risk by over half in three years. Look at standard care on the left. The incidence over the of type 2 diabetes was 23%. Those uh, on the lifestyle, individualized lifestyle program, the relative risk was 0.42. If you're familiar with uh, risk, you know that anything uh, at that magnitude of change, this is highly effective, highly significant uh, number. So then the diabetes prevention program, this one was done in the US. It's a multi-center study, multi-million dollar study, and uh, 3,000 individuals with impaired glucose tolerance. So this was pre-diabetes. This was before they had a diagnosis of diabetes. And you can see their characteristics here. They were randomized for 2.8 years. Actually, the study was intended to be a four-year study. We'll get to that in a minute. One group was a step one diet with a placebo. The second group was the step one diet with metformin, 850 milligrams twice a day. And the third group was lifestyle modification. They had to uh, attain, achieve, and, and maintain a 7% weight loss and 150 minutes of physical activity per week. This was done with some individualized uh, lifestyle coaching and phone calls, etc. Well, here's the results that we find. The advice-only group, the incidence was 11 per 100 person years. The metformin group was reduced. That was 7.8. But the lowest of all, actually, was the lifestyle uh, group. They had a 4.8. This is the relative risk here, again, of a 0.44. The reason this study was only 2.8 years was it was stopped. This study was stopped by the Ethics Committee because it was unethical to continue having the advice only with the placebo at that rate. There was another study, a low-fat plant diet for type 2 diabetes. This was, of course, very relevant to our study there in the Marshall Islands and uh, just recently published. How does a low-fat vegan diet affect serum glucose levels persons with type 2 diabetes, it was a randomized trial comparing them to the ADA diet, the American Diabetes Association diet, looking at uh, serum blood sugar over a 22-week period. First random group, well, 49 patients. This was the experimental group. Their diet was about 10% fat, 15% protein, 75% carbohydrate. This was uh, basically uh, complex carbohydrates, vegetables, fruits, grains, and legumes, and the ADA diet, which I've summarized very briefly here, 15 20% protein, less than 7% saturated fat, 60 to 70% carbohydrate, and uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, cholesterol less than 200 milligrams a day. Many of us wish that our patients would eat that well. Okay, so it wasn't a bad diet, it was a good diet. Here's the results. This was published in Diabetes Care 2006. Basically what you can see is the ADA diet is the red, and the plant diet is the blue. To my mind, one of the most significant things that uh, this chart shows is that the blue lines continue to decline. What we often see, as you know, any of you who've worked with lifestyle changes, we see this pattern more uh, in the red line is what we see. We see that people have improvement, and then there's a regression back to the uh, unfortunate old habits. But it's uh, quite interesting to me, and I believe we need to study more. I believe they're going to be studying more and understanding what, why did the uh, plant diet continue to produce ongoing benefit. Some of you are familiar with the Lifestyle Heart Trial. This was uh, done by Ornish and Company and published. This was looking at heart disease. This is very really relevant to di type 2 diabetes because this is the primary cause of death with their high increased risk. So this study is worth looking at. They had 28 patients assigned to the experimental group. It was a low-fat vegetarian diet, smoking cessation, stress management and moderate exercise, can they compare them to 20 in a usual care control group? This was first published in Lancet in the year 90. What we see here, let's look at these results. This is a percent change. What we did here, this was a, a blinded angiographic evaluation. So they took angiograms and these were evaluated as, uh, by the experts without knowing which individuals were in what group, et cetera. 
So first on the left, I have the controls, and on the right, the treatment. And we're looking here at all blockages. The yellow is all blockages. So the controls had an increase of 8%. At the same period of time, the treatment group had a reduction of 5.5%. Quite remarkable, isn't it? And then when you look at the blockages that are over 50%, because you know it's this, the more difficult, the more symptomatic, the more uh, concerning ones are the ones over 50%. And the good news is that, first off, this is good. These only, those progress more slowly in the control group, but excellent news is that they responded even more to the treatment. The lifestyle intervention has been shown repeatedly that lifestyle interventions are more effective the more severe the disease, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, very effective. Net change of 13%. You know, what, what's happening to these individuals right here, by the way, this control group, uh, they're, they're, they're under care, by the way, they're getting, they're getting medical care, it's, it's usual care. Just in layman's terms, what, what's happening to that group? They're dying of heart disease. Yeah, this, this group right here. They're, they're dying of heart disease. The outcome of this process is predictable. We, I mean, the, so keep that in mind. What's happening over here is these individuals are improving. Their disease is improving. They are not dying. They are, they're going the other direction. And uh, that's, wh that's what we're all about, is trying to save lives. Well, of course, the question was, well, what can we okay, that's one year. So, the qu uh, very good question. What's going to happen over time? So, Ornish published uh, five-year results in 1998 in Journal of American Medical Association. So this is five-year results. And what we see here is the controls continued. It's 27.7%, almost 28%. The treatment group had dropped 8%. So, it's quite a difference. And it certainly causes a lot of us to, it, gets my, it got my attention, makes me want to find out how can we do this more effectively and more frequently. Uh, I don't have time to go into it, but here's a dose-response relationship showing that those who had the most adherent had the most benefit and those who had the least adherence had the least benefit. It's a typical, it's one of uh, Hill's criteria of causation. Now here's a very interesting study and they did, uh, it was published in 2004 in circulation. I want to ask you a question, don't answer this, but I do, it's worth asking yourself. If your mother or your wife or your whatever, husband, a loved one had chest pain, which group would you hope that they got randomized to if they were in this study? What they had here was as a prospective trial to determine whether angioplasty or standing could be as effective as one year exercise training program. 51 patients were assigned to the exercise group. They had uh, greater than 20 minutes a day on a bicycle at 70% of symptom-free maximum heart rate. And they had 60 minutes a week of aerobic group exercise. And then they had 50 assigned to a stent angioplasty group. Again, it's your loved one. They've got angina. Which one would you hope they were randomized to? And it's very, this is, this, to my mind, this is a significant study. Um, and what we see here is survival. They, everybody starts off with no events. Over time, in a survival graph, the curves come down, right? So at, at the stent group, where 70% were event-free at one year. However, the exercise group, 88% were event-free. The relative difference was 26%. You would hope that your mom got put in the exercise group in that study. Okay, here's a portfolio diet. This was done by David Jenkins up in Toronto. They were looking at comparing. This is kind of bold. They're actually, uh, thank you. I'll take questions if it's okay at, at, at the end. Were they on the same diet? Yes, there was no change in diet. A very good question. It was only an exercise change. Yes, sir. This was comparing diet to medication. It's getting a little, a little bold here. 46 hyperlipidemics. They were randomized to receive either a step two diet, which is very low in saturated fat with low fat dairy, or the step two diet plus lovastatin. This would be a typical beginning dose. And the third group was a portfolio diet, no medications. And they had plant sterols. All of these are per 2,000 kilocal. So it's two grams of plant sterols, 43 grams soy protein, 20 grams of viscous fibers, and 28 grams of almonds. That's basically a serving of almonds. So, published in 2003. Here's the results that I want to point out. Really, the lobostatin group and the portfolio diet are here. And the controls 
are up here. You see a significant difference there. And another very interesting thing is there's really no significant difference between the outcomes between the ones that got the lovastatin and the step two diet versus the ones that got the portfolio diet. This is remarkable, isn't it? So, Harvard. Harvard uh, Nurses Health Study, I uh, mentioned already, they had about 85,000 nurses. Their health professional follow-up study, about 42,000 doctors. And what we see here is they found that each daily serving of fruits and vegetables reduced risk of coronary heart disease by 4%. The relative risk was 0.96. With that large of a group, they had a significant of less than 0.01 for trend. And here's the, what the graph looked like. So there's, it's a, it's, the evidence is overwhelming. Here's one we might be a little more familiar with, at least those of us who are part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Adventist Health Study began in 1974, still going on. We're following up some of these people. There's 34,000 California Adventists. They compared them to other people living in California. Found they lived 7 to 14 years longer. Those living the longest actually ate the most plant foods and the least animal products. This study also found that eating vegetables, eating nuts, and drinking water, if you've seen some of the different studies that have been published, each one of those has been found to reduce risk. Nuts, the walnut studies, and some of the others published by Dr. Sabate, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine and other, other journals. This one by Jackie Chan was very interesting. She found that drinking, those who drank uh, two glasses or less a day, compared to those who drank five or more, had twice the risk. So drinking five glasses of water or more per day compared to those who drank two or less cut your risk in half. And that was after adjusting for all other factors that they were able to adjust for. This is actually the National Geographic of uh, November last year. Remember that? Seeing this uh, Okinawan gentleman on his hands and head there. And Seventh-day Adventists were one of three groups featured in that article for centenarians. I need to move on. So I'm going to let you just look at the pictures on this one. But basically, uh, BMI is inversely associated with the intake of plant foods, numerous studies. Here's one I reserve for my patients as well. Well, <laughs> your weight is perfect. You're just a few feet too short. Now, one thing you're always supposed to do when you're looking at uh, the rationale for an intervention is look at the biological mechanisms, right? You don't only really show epidemiological studies, we want to look at the biological mechanisms. So I'm not going to go into great depth, but I'm going to acquaint you briefly with it. There are plenty of biological explanations for why diet would do what we're observing it doing. And here's one of them is the field of nutrigenomics. It's really an emerging science. It's built around the discovery that nutrient intake modulates the genome. You know, we all know that all cells in the human body come from a single cell, single progenitor, have identical copies of DNA, right? Yeah, we know that. But did you ever stop to think about another thing we know, and that is that various cells behave very differently. They all have the same, co same copy of DNA, but the nose doesn't look like the ear, and the ear doesn't look like the eye. And so it's, it's uh, self-evident, but we haven't really thought about that sometimes. Well. The genes in the DNA obviously can be turned on and off. And not every gene is on in every cell. And science is desperately seeking to learn how to switch the genes on and off. That's a worthy thing. And in the process so far, we've discovered that diet or nutrients exert one of the strongest effects on gene expression. In fact, if you ask the molecular geneticists, they will, they'll, they will tell you that the strongest thing we have right now to modulate gene expression is nutrients. And we're trying to find more sexy tools, more exciting tools. So nutrigenomics is seeking to capitalize on this, on this fact. Now it turns out not all diets are created equal. We know that. Foods do different things to the genome. And there are differences between various animal foods as well as between plant foods. But really, the greatest difference seems to exist between animal foods and plant foods. And research is continuing to, to show this. Here's a little quote I just took out of the Carcinogenesis, 2007. It was, it's just very recent. Dr. Kahn and, and company. The last decade has witnessed an exponential increase in the number of studies investigating how different components of the diet interact at the molecular and cellular level to determine the fate of a cell. It is now apparent that many dietary chemopreventive agents with promise for human consumption can also preferentially inhibit the growth of tumor cells by targeting one or more signaling intermediates leading to induction of apoptosis. This is not a lifestyle medicine 
doctor. This is not a, uh, a person advocating this uh, radical idea. He's saying, after a decade of research, we're finding there are numerous chemopreventive things in the plant foods that directly impact the cellular function and can lead to apoptosis, which of course, as you know, is the body's primary way of dealing with uh, cancer. One of, the, one of the primary ways. One other thing I want to mention is epigenetics. This is the emerging science built around the discovery of transgenerational genomic effects. Non-DNA mediated, non-DNA mediated transgenerational genomic effects. We know that environmental influences can exert phenotypic effects. Phenotypic means that's how you look or how the organism looks as opposed to the genotypic is the genome. For example, smoking. Okay, we all tell our patients to stop smoking and that's because it has a detrimental phenotypic effect. Well, by definition, environmental effects are non-heritable. That's what this environmental is, non-heritable effects. Heritable effects are genetic rather than environmental, right? There's a couple of references at the bottom there to, to uh, very interesting about this. Genes are turned on and off by these environmental influences. We just talked about that, nutrigenomics, okay? But we found that genes can be switched on or off transgenerationally, in other words, across generations. And the progeny actually start life, we did too, with the gene switches set by the environmental influences exerted upon our ancestors. Very, very interesting science. Turns out the genome is much more than mere DNA, okay? A host of molecules and molecular forces interact to control it. Histones, chaperone proteins are some of the early ones we discovered, but we're learning more and more continually. Turns out that there's this whole set of nano tools managing the DNA. The DNA, you realize, is miles long if it was stretched out, right? And it, here it is in this tiny little cell being managed somehow so that transcription occurs when it's supposed to and when it's not supposed to, it doesn't and so forth. We would, we would love to have the ability to create tools like the nano tools that are controlling the DNA. Some of these involve permanent but reversible chemical changes. A little illustration. How much is a mouse worth? Well, it may not seem as worth much to some of us. Some people think it's worth a lot. Here's a, an interesting illustration. Which one of these mice would you think is uh, worth the most? Well, uh, my signs give away. On the right, we have a mouse called the agouti mouse. It's been bred very carefully with genes to make it become obese, develop heart disease, diabetes, so we have a model to study human chronic disease. The Goody Mouse, it's worth more than any car in the parking lot, I guarantee you. And the mouse, an interesting experiment was done. It's been used mainly, of course, to study medications and cellular processes, but in, at Duke in the year 2000, a professor and a, and a, a, a research fellow got a a kind of a wild idea, many people thought, and that was they said, let's see if we can treat this diabetes and obesity in this agouti mouse with lifestyle change, with diet. And so they did. They did this experiment. They designed a diet, and they fed them. And not only was it effective in helping the mother's disease, but when the mother had a baby, they actually thought there was a lab error. Because obviously this baby did not have her genes. <laughs> it was like a regular mouse. And quickly, some DNA studies proved that yes, these two mice have, this is her progeny. But the dietetic changes to the mother changed the expression of DNA to the extent that the baby didn't even look like it had the genetic propensity for obesity. And the good news is that some of those changes lasted for three to four generations in the offspring. Yeah, up to three to four generations. Now these specific phenotypes were induced by a designer diet. It was a DNA methylating diet. You can read about it in the study. But the implications are staggering. How we eat can transmit effects to the third and fourth generation of our descendants. Lifestyle medicine. The use of therapeutic lifestyle interventions and treatment and management of disease. This is a relatively new specialty area I have the privilege of being involved in. It emphasizes the use of lifestyle interventions as medical treatment. It's growing really out of this emerging research on the treatment effects of diet and exercise. For the longest time, we've understood that lifestyle were, was a risk factor. What we're coming to understand more and more is it is a treatment, not just a risk factor. 
it is not only for primary prevention, but it's part of secondary tertiary prevention. And as such, it ought to be a part of, where medically indicated, it ought to be a part of our treatment. So there's a growing movement in lifestyle medicine, and most of us in, in medicine have not been trained in this, so we need some further under guidance and instruction, CME, et cetera. Visit our site sometime, learn about us, aclm.net. Now, the Diabetes Wellness Project. Canvas Back Missions has been working, providing medical services in the Marshall Islands for over 20 years and for type 2 diabetes, really, for over 11 years. In 96, 98, they conducted two successful lifestyle intervention pilot programs in the Marshall Islands. They, they were adapted from the New START programs that are used at lifestyle centers in the United States and also the, the Guam SDA Clinic Wellness Center. They were quite, they were quite successful, quite, help, uh, quite good results. And uh, the Ministry of Health actually asked for Canvas Back to help them make these programs more widely available. They said, we need a center of our own. You know, we need some way to provide this to more of our people. And so over time, we were able to get some funding and get a team together. And, just, and the Diabetes Wellness Project I'm talking to you about is the result of that. We're going to study, uh, right now, our plans are about 150. We hope if funding lasts that we can have a larger, but 150 diabetics. We're selecting people over A1Cs over eight, and they're being randomized for six months to either a comprehensive lifestyle intervention, which is low cholesterol, high fiber, plant-based diet and exercise, or optimal usual care. The usual care in the, in the Marshall Islands, candidly, is, is not very good. We have uh, average blood sugars running 230 at the beginning of our study. That's, that's not very good management by anybody's standards. Here's a group picture of the first <coughs> cohort. And here's our intervention. Basically, it, it starts off at an intense, for the first two weeks, we see them every day, four and a half hours, <laughs> group sessions, and an hour of exercise. We prepare their meals, we feed them, and we exercise them, and we t teach them, and we have hands-on cooking classes, and they, they, eat, they eat their own food that they cook during the cooking class. Then at uh, the next few weeks, we meet twice weekly, two hour, actually this is, um, that's incorrect, that's uh, three hour group sessions, and we have a meal and then weekly, and then bi-weekly. And so you can see we're sort of just tapering off. Here's a, a schematic, if you will, of, of the timeline. Here's baseline, two, six, 12, and 24 weeks. We randomized people over uh, eight to treatment group or controls. And then we had a very interesting uh, uh, aspect of this is that people who are in a control group have often, they've, they've wanted to be in the study and they don't w really want to be in the control group. So what we had is after, at the end of the, uh, when the next group starts, we allow them to, to cross over. So we allow those who want to, to cross over at the end of the six weeks into the next treatment group. We recently started up a group that had quite a bit of, quite about 14 of those folks that did that. And then of course we go on with follow up on the ones that do not cross over. And it turns out that the controls who crossed over are some of the absolute best results we've seen. I'll get to that in a minute. So plant foods to treat diabetes. Here's us. Uh, Brenda Davis is a dietitian with expertise in diabetes. I was going to show you her book. Maybe I'll do that at the end. She's written Defeating Diabetes and a number of other books. Here's some of the Marshallese cooks uh, cooking up our medicine. And we use a uh, four food classes. It'll, you'll see this better in a minute. First class, second class, third class, and fourth class. We basically encourage people to move to a higher class. So we want to move you up to first class. We'd like to give you an upgrade. So when, it, when you fly on our program, we like you to all fly first class. You'll find it interesting. A lot of people look at this and they say, well, tofu? I thought that was health food. Uh, vegetables and fruits? Well, if you look, you'll see why. This is canned. This is fresh. So we're, we're trying to get them to eat the healthier foods. Uh, it's got to be something fairly simple. We also use an exercise. We have a very nice exercise room, but in reality what, we gotta, what we're using mostly is walking because that's what we want them to do is walk. Here's uh, results from our first 10 days. This was the uh, morning fasting blood sugar, the after the morning exercise, and then after the evening meal in the evening. So here was our regression line. And basically we had uh, a fasting blood sugar uh, showing a 74, 74 point drop in 10 days, 7.4 7 times the number of days. We had quite a, quite a good result. Now here's the first cohort, okay, this is cohort number one. And what you'll see is, this is top line is controls, the bottom line is treatment group. We had, this is not a crossover study. This crossover is not the way we want things to be. 
<laughs> here we had, I mean, you know, if I was, uh, if I was, try if I was uh, trying to hide the data, I'd definitely hide this graph because this doesn't look very good. <coughs> what it does show is that it's highly effective when we feed them. When they start feeding themselves, they begin a regression. And it shows what actually you would expect in the control group, and that is if these numbers are not satisfactory, right? The doctors are doing the right thing to bring this group down. So, so this is a very plausible, very reasonable kind of thing. What, uh, the question is, well, why did these people go up there? Why didn't, they, why didn't they doctors bring them down? What we find is, one of the problems we're fighting is that when the people get in the program, they don't want to go see the doctor. They say, well, I've got, I'm doing lifestyle. I don't need to see the doctor. And they, and they are not taking, uh, they're not following the doctor's advice as they should. So we've actually re, we've adjusted our design to, to uh, avoid some of that. But let me go on to the next. Uh, this was cohort number two. So here's our control group. You know, there's all, everybody, you know what, all of us know, we know something that we should be doing for our health that we're not doing. So as soon as we get in a study, well, we start doing that because we, well, we know that already. So everybody gets better. Even the control group does better in the first few weeks. But then things kind of go back, and, and then this is, so, but this group, they do much better. And, and you see, here we didn't have the crossover, and this looks better. I mean, we, we're, so I, we're trainable. We're, we're getting better at what we're doing. And uh, maybe the good news, the best news, is this last cohort, number three. I, don't, I only have six-week data to show you. We've got some 12-week data, but I don't have it on the, on the graph. And what you see here is that uh, the control group here in dotted line, they had the, the dip and started back up, typical. The intervention group had a, a large drop. And actually, if you look at these two numbers, they still drop more, even though this is a smooth curve and it's assuming a, a low point here. But actually, there was an overall it's still going down. And that's very interesting because this is an important trend. This is what we've been looking for, okay? We've been looking for a, a situation in which we would have these numbers continue to come down. And what we find is that, that there's, uh, with each co uh, cohort, they've been doing better than the previous cohort. And cohort three is the first group to have continued improvement beyond two weeks. Also, it's the first group to include crossover control subjects, and I think those two facts are related. We broke this out by subgroup, and we're looking at zero, two, and six weeks for the Intervention group, there were 10 naive subjects. There were six from control group one and 13 from control group two that had, these two had crossed over. And then 29 altogether compared to the control group of 19. This was, so this, these people, 19 here and 10 here, were randomly assigned. These two groups, you know, did the crossover. And so what we find is when we look at the control group, there's a little bit of change, not much, but, but there's some positive change in six weeks. But when you look, compared to the intervention group, there's much stronger change. So the intervention group definitely is doing better in six weeks than the control group. Well, that's good. <laughs> but what's uh, even more interesting is that the, compare, the crossovers are doing far better. And notice what happened between week two and week six here. Went up. And here it went down. So these individuals in control group crossovers, they're doing better, and they continue to do better. These are motivated subjects. These are people who said, hey, I want to do that, and I've been waiting six months to do it. <laughs> so there's plenty of evidence that lifestyle changes can slow your arrest or reverse the high blood sugars. And the existing approaches for type 2 diabetes in the Marshall Islands, and I would suggest to you even in the world, they're not working. They're not working satisfactorily. We're losing the, the, we're losing the war on diabetes right now around the globe. And intensive lifestyle changes can work. That two-week results show they can work if they are maintained over time. That's a, and that's the issue. And we believe that we are learning better how to do that in this particular population. We believe that that is the, the challenge that, that medicine faces and needs to address. We've got to, we can't say this is too hard. Who's going who's gonna to give up and say, oh, it's too hard, we can't do it? Can't go that route. We've got to say, no, it's hard, but we will find out how to do it. Of course, every researcher is paid to say that more research is needed. Yeah, but the fact is, we do. We need more research to, to look at intervention and to study long-term results. And we are collecting follow-up data, and it's, it's, it's uh, getting interesting. Cameras back, Loma Linda. We're going to continue working on this. We hope to expand the program into more of Micronesia uh, if it is successful. And I will have to say to you, as the chief uh, clinical scientist on the project, it is not certain yet that this is working. We have some good indications that we're doing some good things, but it's... Um, it's far from declaring success. So, questions? Thank you for your time. Yes, in the back. Yes, the, the question is, um, as we're advocating, I'm advocating fruits and vegetables, and what if we uh, talk about a population, for example, in the Eskimos in the Arctic Circle, where, 
where there's few vegetables, fruits and vegetables. Well, first, my point, my first comment would be, that's correct. That um, you obviously, we we ran into this in the Marshall Islands. We come over with a program built around things done, well, let's say, in the U.S. mainland or even on Guam, and it doesn't work. It, it, it won't automatically just drop into the Marshall Islands and work there. So we've had to spend a good bit of time, a lot of our time, has been finding what we can encourage them to eat that they are either number one, it's been in their culture in the past, because they used 50 years ago, 60 years ago, they didn't have diabetes. It's, it's a change in diet. They've largely, what they did was they adopted the canned processed food that came over with the GIs and et cetera. <laughs> and, and so, but your point is well taken, and, and uh, what I would say is, number one, the, the Eskimos are not diabetes free. They, but in, they are a lot like the Micronesians. Micronesians have, uh, tend to be a heavier than, uh, than say, U Northern Europeans, but the weight does not seem to c be as harmful to their, I mean, these people have better uh, cholesterol and better triglycerides, even though they have more weight than, than a, a Northern European. So we have to look at the people group. And, and so the Eskimos, it's my understanding, although I'm not, ex I'm not an expert on the Inuit, but it's my understanding that they do have issues with uh, heart disease and with diabetes too. But I think it's because they're adopting the unhealthy processed diet that, that we Caucasians and Northern Europeans are, bring, are, are spreading around the world. Can you share with us some of the things that you changed through the studies that have, have caused more compliance? So what do you attribute the better results? Yes, yes, so yeah, the question is, yes, good question. The question is, can I share some things that we've done to improve compliance and to, and to help with that improvement we're seeing in these outcomes? Yes, what we, well, it's going to maybe be a surprise to you, but we did uh, one thing that would seem counterproductive, and that is we actually dropped the coming twice a month the last three months. We decided that was, that wasn't really having any significant treatment effect, and we dropped it. Another thing that we did was we, however, on the other end, is that we started having these individuals uh, share uh, more amongst themselves. We are, we started using more group dynamic is what I think the, the right term would be. In the first cohort, it was kind of new. We were doing more lecture style. We still use that, but now we have more uh, interaction, and um, that seems to be part of it. We, what we are doing for the cohort that just started up is we actually are recruiting subjects that are already being seen by the public, uh, the Ministry of Health for diabetes because what we found was that we were, when we were screening the public and getting new diabetics, that was, that was good because we were identifying people that were untreated, didn't know they had diabetes, but unfortunately many of them didn't go to the Ministry of Health and start getting treatment. And so our study was subject to, to uh, some bias. So we are now are only recruiting subjects that are already getting medical care so that hopefully we'll eliminate that problem where in that first cohort they, they crossed over. So some of both things. We're improving the, the, the group dynamic use and we're selecting patients that are already connected with the health care system. Was there a question back there? In, in this day and age now, we uh, take patients with secondary heart risk where we had some uh, heart disease uh, one way, reason, way or another. What could you do in a study that would still be ethical? In other words, I, it seemed to me to be very difficult for you to match up your study against the statin and the secondary risk factor patient who probably has to be on the statin. Uh, but we haven't, you didn't show us any tests, did you, of uh, a statin versus uh, 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 your diet with uh, with the heart risk outcome? No, the good, let, me, let me try to repeat the question. Um, question is that on secondary uh, risk <coughs> modification where you're putting a person on uh, a statin to lower their cholesterol, the um, first aspect of the question was how could you do research on that because it's an ethical uh, issue. You can't just randomly take people off of a statin because you want to do a study. And then the, and the other thing you pointed out was that I didn't show any data here on cholesterol or secondary risk factor, and that's correct. Today I limited myself to primary outcome, which is blood sugar, and I didn't even show you all of that because I have data on the A1C and other things. I just chose to show what I had most readily available. I would like to say this about the study about looking at comparing lifestyle changes to, say, medication in, a, in the setting you're talking about where it's, it's, it's risk reduction. And, uh, I agree with you. We, we can't reasonably take people off of a statin 
uh, in, in a randomized manner. But what we can do, and, and what is very interesting is, and we find this, we were taking people off of, or our, our, the, the doctors uh, in charge of their care, were taking people off of medicine in the first week of our study. And it always happens, in fact, in the first week. And, and we didn't take them off, but if you're on a hypertensive, if you're on a, you know, a medication for your blood pressure and you make some serious lifestyle changes, you'll be, you'll be over-medicated. You'll be hypotensive. You'll, you'll have problems. It, it, now, with cholesterol, we don't think that there's a problem if your cholesterol drops to 100 or 110, but most of us would probably say, well, we could take them off the statin if it's down that low. I mean, why do we have to keep it there? So, so what I'm saying to you is that the design I would recommend is we would do a randomized assignment and then we would take the medicine off of those that was unnecessary and then at that point you would start to be able to see unmedicated versus medicated, right? And so it can be done, but it is tricky and I appreciate your, your sensitivity to the ethical issues. Uh, there was another at the back. You know, I was in India and 75% of the Indians are vegetarian, but they have a lot of diabetes. Oh, the question, well, let me repeat it. For, the question was, is 75% uh, of the people in India are vegetarian, and yet they have problems with chronic disease also, and how do you explain that if, if vegetables and uh, plant foods are so healthy? I like to point out to people that uh, pure uh, fat is, can be a vegetable source. You can, you can make uh, oil and 100% and of calories from fat from plants. You can make... Uh, sugar beets are plants, but when you turn them into, do you know that sugar is one of the purest substances commonly manufactured on the planet? <laughs> it's 99.9% .9 pure. Uh, it is unhealthy. Uh, and so plants can be turned into uh, very unhealthy foods. I do, I'm not saying that, that the um, foods, the vegetables eaten in India are more unhealthy than they are anywhere else. I'm just pointing out that there's no guarantee that being on plants plant foods will make you healthy. It's, we, but there is there's, uh, the growing evidence, like the European uh, study, the EPIC study, and the studies coming out of India. We're getting more and more of these broad uh, population-based epidemiological studies, and they're all showing the same thing in whatever population. Of course, the China study uh, with Campbell showed out of China the same thing, that it's unprocessed food, plant foods. It's not vegetables. It's it's unprocessed. In fact, I I I uh, tell people well, if I would I would say to you that um, for my patient I would be more interested in having a patient if they're going to make one change. They're going to make one change only. Unfortunately, I hope none of them will ever say that. But I would say well then the biggest and best change would be to go to as unprocessed a diet as you can. Uh, look at all the things that we do to plant foods that make them problematic. I mean, the, the trans fats that we made, we tried to take vegetable oil, which is, was thought to be healthier than animal fat, and we decided to make it kind of like, like butter, and so we made trans fats, and wow, it just spreads like butter, looks like butter, and uh, kills worse than butter. <laughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so the question and the comment was an observation made uh, about China, and that um, they were very few obese people, but then when the American uh, fast food uh, industries come in, uh, they started having trouble with obesity, and that is very true. In fact, the study you mentioned, the, one of the, the Nihon, see, Nihon San study was done in the Japanese, one of the first ones doing what you're talking about, and that is looking at people who lived in Japan, and some of the relatives moved to Honolulu, that's the Han part, and some moved to San Francisco, and that was the sand part of the study. And they had the three legs, and they were genetically from the same pool, and we found that the heart disease and whatnot basically uh, starts showing up uh, in the second generation in the new... Um, and, the, and, and the other thing was it was shown that uh, someone f did some very careful study and showed that there was a dose-response relationship if you use the acculturation as a surrogate marker of dosing. So the more the, more the children had acculturated to, to the local society and ways of doing things, the worse their, their chronic diseases were. Yeah, we, I mean really, I, don't, I think no one that's in, uh, knowledgeable about this topic questions the, that, that the, uh, we know the cause of chronic disease, we know the cause of diabetes, we know the, you know, we, it's, it's our lifestyle. It's largely uh, what we eat and, or don't eat, and what we don't do. It's our lack of, uh, of activity. 
We are, t uh, our, our jobs, inf the information age is a wonderful thing in many ways, except for when it doesn't work. But, um, but it's, it, it makes us sedentary. You, to, do, to do most of what I do, I have to be sitting still. I have to be, you know, I have to, I don't know if I could learn how to jog in place while I could type on a keyboard, maybe I'd be healthier. But most of what I do, I have to be sitting still. And uh, especially if I'm listening to a patient's heart or, or talking to someone. Anyway, my, you get my point. We're all um, moved toward a job that, so we've got to do something about that. We've got to, we've got to have activity in our life. We've got to, they were just, that's the way we seem to either evolved or been created, whatever your model is. Uh, okay. Okay, one the, last. Uh, the hypertensive study in the elderly showed the uh, Mediterranean diet was, was beneficial and all. How does this compare <coughs> to the Mediterranean diet? And also, did you notice these other spin-offs of blood pressure improvement besides what you were measuring? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me repeat it. The question is uh, about the Mediterranean diet and, and how does this compare to that? Uh, do we have any uh, way to compare? And secondly, what about uh, effects on blood pressure and other things? And uh, yeah, the Mediterranean diet, actually I would, uh, people always ask me because I, uh, in this field, they always want to know how I eat and I, you know, I've gotten over being embarrassed or nervous about that. Usually I don't like to, people to, what's in your business, how I eat, you know, I eat, what, I eat chocolate. But, uh, but um, anyway, I would say that I'm more of a Mediterranean type of diet. That's my own personal um, uh, choice. And I think that the Mediterranean diet is, is going to ultimately be a more workable diet than some of the more extreme lower fat. But I will have to, as a researcher and as a, as a you know, we've all got to be, let's be honest, let's have integrity and not just have our dogmatic ideas. But the fact is, we don't have studies yet showing angiographic evidence that Mediterranean diet reverses blockages, but we've got good evidence that a very low fat diet did. And I've got the same, I've got a bit of a problem. I'd love to compare our, our program to a Mediterranean diet, but uh, the fact is, it is more Mediterranean. I, I, I haven't shown you that, but our fat, the fat in our uh, diet we're recommending and feeding these people is probably close to 20%, but it's mostly that it's the omega-3s, it's mostly the uh, olive oil, the Mediterranean kind of fats. Uh, the other thing I, w I would say about the other part of the question, in general we are seeing better results, stronger results, uh, improvements in blood sugar than we are in any of the other risk factors. We, we see some improvement um, in the other risk factors, but not nearly as strong an effect, say in cholesterol or triglycerides as we're seeing in blood sugar, which I guess is a good thing since we're studying diabetes, but uh, um, it's not, we're not seeing any earth shaking. Now blood pressure does change, come down some. What I found it looks like, um, you know we have, a, I'm being very candid, we have a, uh, my bane, my biggest bane as a researcher on this is that dropout. We have a lot of trouble getting these people to stay in the study. The good news is they can't go anywhere. I mean it's a small island so we can find them. Uh, <laughs> so we go find them, I mean we, we do, we literally go, you know, we, by then we know them, you know, we go to their home, hey we need you, please. Come over, get a blood test, uh, and we've done that. But uh, anyway, so uh, the results show us that that um, the ones who exercise, exercise seems to be maybe uh, a very important. Let's just put it that way. I've talked about diet mainly here this morning or this afternoon, but it is uh, exercise is very important, and. Um, we have these people wearing pedometers. By the way, are you, you're aware that a pedometer is, is, an, uh, is a measurement, but it's also an intervention, right? The studies have shown that, that wearing a pedometer increases your exercise. So I want to recommend it to you. It's a very cheap, it's like four or five dollars, you can get a pedometer, wear it, and, and reset it. I mean, that is the other part. You don't, don't just you know, tie it to your shoe, forget it. But, but if you wear a pedometer and you reset it and look at it every day, it actually increases your exercise. So we are using it actually more as an intervention than as a measurement, but we, we are doing both. And, uh, and I think I'm giving the participants the impression that we're doing it more for measurement than we really are. Uh, but it, what I, where I was going is that the best measures I have looks like that, that fitness is the biggest effect on blood pressure rather than diet itself in this group. This is, you know, Research is an interesting thing. 
It's a very frustrating thing, but it's very fun in a way because uh, you just never know what you're going to learn. I mean, you, you oftentimes don't learn what you thought you were going to get at all. And uh, so our second year, we are, we are actually adding another thing, and I know I need to quit. Times uh, past, but we're going to add proteomic studies. We have a perfect setting. We have a small population. These are expensive studies. We have a small population, and we're showing a major change in their status at two weeks. And we've just recently changed our intervention to where we're going to be going for six weeks. We're going to have two weeks intensive, one week of tw uh, sh twice a week, then another intensive week twice a week and another intensive week. So we're going to go to, we're in, what would you do if you had a study like this? You'd increase the dosing and, and, and the half-life, right? I mean, you'd see if, the, see if a stronger dose would do better. So we're going to increase the dosing, increase the, try to increase the half-life and see what happens. But anyway, so the proteomic studies, I think, are going to be very, very interesting. Uh, we may very well uh, find out uh, one of two things. We may find out how to screen these people and identify who will do best well, that would be a nice thing. If we could figure out ahead of time who's going to do well and who's not, we could just, the ones that aren't, go ahead and do something else. And the other possibility is that we may actually discover some new uh, uh, susceptibility genes because when you start looking at uh, what's changing um, and when the diabetes improves, very possibly we'll turn up some new genes, uh, candidates. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, yes, Bill, I think you had a question. Yeah, there was a question about... Um diabetes in India and wouldn't it be appropriate to point out that the vegetarian tradition in India is primarily lacto-vegetarian so there's a lot of dairy product getting in there and it's fairly saturated fat yes I appreciate his point and that is um, of course all vegetarian diets are not are not the same and it and uh, there is evidence that animal products even uh, milk products have an impact on diabetes and uh, that may very well be a factor there Bill Okay, well, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, appreciate being here. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.